Um, and here's one of them right now. We got John Light giving us a brief history of blockchain name systems. Woo! Yeah. Thank you for having me, Lisa, and of course for, for organizing this. This is awesome. And thank you for all the previous speakers for the amazing content. Um, So as Lisa mentioned, I'm going to be talking uh, ab to give you guys a brief history of blockchain name systems. Uh, just as a show of hands, who uh, in this room is familiar with the basic mechanics of how a blockchain works? That's, that's most people, okay. Um, well, f then, f you know, for the, not to leave out the minority who didn't raise their hand, a quick, uh, you know, explanation, uh, very quick, um, by the way, speaking of time, how are we on time? What do, what do I, ha how much time do I have? When should I stop talking? Okay, cool. So I was just plan on... Cool, I'll just plan on a half hour then. Um, so, sure, I'll plan for five minutes for questions. Great, thank you. Um, so, as I was saying, for the folks who don't know exactly how a blockchain works, um, just think of it like uh, a chronological history of transactions that is secure. If you can just accept that as a given of the system that you have an ordered chronological uh, history of events that have occurred in this network, everything else just kind of falls into place. So the story of blockchain name systems really starts with this idea that was put forth uh, by Zuko, Wil Zuko Wilcox uh, that has since been dubbed Zuko's Triangle. The basic concept is that uh, th there are three features that you want for uh, a name. The, uh, the name should be human meaningful. It should be decentralized and it should be secure. Um, at the time that Zuko first formulated uh, Zuko's triangle, uh, he said, you can only choose two. And this was true up until very recently. So for example, uh, a name that, the, the name that your parents gave you, uh, that is human meaningful. You know, human, hu I can tell this to you and you understand it right away. It's also decentralized because your parents gave it to you. There wasn't some central authority handing out, you know, names at the hospital. Um, but it's not secure because people can have the same name. So when somebody says uh, John Smith, you, there could be thousands of people who that name refers to. So. That's an example of a name that is human meaningful and decentralized, but it's not secure. Uh, then you can have a name that is human meaningful and secure, but it's not decentralized. For example, archive.org. That is a name that I can tell you and it makes sense to you. It's secure because only the Internet Archive can actually use that name, but it's not decentralized because that name uh, is controlled by a centralized company called ICANN. And that's how they maintain the security of that name. Uh, and then finally, you can have a name that is decentralized and secure, but it's not human meaningful. A typical example of this would be a PGP key, which is decentralized because anybody can create a PGP key. It's secure because as long as you keep the private key to yourself, you can always prove ownership of the name. Uh, but it's not human meaningful because it, it's just a, a long string of numbers and letters and, it, and, and humans can't really comprehend uh, numbers and strings that look like that. So up until recently, uh, with the invention of the blockchain, 
this this was the conundrum. How, how you know can we can we actually transcend this though? Well, after the invention of Bitcoin, uh, you know, people were thinking of all these interesting ways that you could use uh, the blockchain um, to create new kinds of decentralized systems. And one of the ideas that was thrown around on the Bitcoin Talk Forum, which was the main community forum at the time, uh, was this idea called BitDNS. Uh, and Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, uh, chimed in on this thread in the forum and he said, I think it would be possible for BitDNS to be a completely separate network and separate blockchain, yet share CPU power with Bitcoin. The only overlap is to make it so miners can search for proof of work for both networks simultaneously. What amazing foresight, as we will uh, soon find out. Um, but this was back in 2010, so people were already kind of figuring out, hey, maybe this blockchain can be used to you know, solve this long-standing uh, problem with naming. Uh, then, in January of 2011, uh, Aaron Swartz uh, published a post on his blog called Squaring the Triangle, Secure Decentralized Human-Readable Names. And Aaron Swartz wrote, Tonight, I realized that you can indeed use Bitcoin to square Zuko's triangle. The names are secure. They're identifiable by a key of arbitrary length and cannot be stolen. They're human meaningful. The name can be whatever string you like. And they're decentralized. There is no central authority who determines who gets what name, and yet they're available to everyone in the network. Zuko's triangle has been squared. And just a few months later, we saw the release of the first in production working blockchain name system, Namecoin. Namecoin was announced in April of 2011, just a few months after Aaron Swartz's blog post in an announcement thread on that same Bitcoin talk forum where Satoshi Nakamoto first commented on the possibility of a DNS-specific blockchain. Namecoin has very basic features that you would expect of a decentralized DNS. Uh, you could uh, register and transfer domain names directly on the blockchain using a public-private key pair the same way that uh, users could use their public-private key pair to transfer uh, bitcoins on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, originally, it was mined uh, with its own hashing power, but eventually the developers decided to merge mine uh, Namecoin with Bitcoin, meaning that uh, the hashing power that is securing the Bitcoin network could also be used to secure the Namecoin network at the same time. Um, this is, this, this was a, you know, it's a kind of controversial move. Uh, other networks have also taken this move uh, to merge mine with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency networks, but it's controversial for reasons that uh, I'll get to uh, in a moment. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, again, Satoshi, with his foresight, uh, you know, predicted that not only was this possible, um, but you could do it uh, by coupling it with the security of Bitcoin itself, which is very interesting. Uh, so some interesting applications that people have developed for Namecoin include this, this uh, browser extension called Meowbit which basically made it possible for you to actually type Namecoin domains into your normal browser and uh, navigate to those websites. Very cool feature. Um, DNS Chain, uh, which is a, a very uh, interesting application and perhaps, in my uh, personal opinion, one of the most important applications of blockchain name system. Uh, if the Let's Encrypt guy is still here uh, or possibly watching this video later, uh, you might want to pay attention to this slide uh, because DNS chain or an application like it can actually fix a lot of the problems that he was talking about with uh, SSL uh, and the certificate authority system. Uh, as you can see, 
Uh, with DNS chain, you can have man in the middle proof connections. You can have simple and secure uh, key distribution. You can have a man in the middle proof API to the blockchain. Uh, you can have free and actually secure SSL certificates, uh, certificate revocation that actually works, DNS based censorship circumvention. Uh, because the names are controlled by public private key pairs directly on the blockchain, uh, seizures are virtually impossible without actually compromising uh, the key pair that owns the name. Uh, and uh, you can have a uh, full certificate transparency using the uh, global uh, authoritative uh, record that is stored in the blockchain. So again, I think this is one of the most uh, interesting and important applications of blockchain name systems uh, because it solves so many of these problems with the not only traditional DNS, but also uh, the traditional certificate authority system. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, this is not an application of uh, Namecoin per se, but there is a really interesting uh, decentralized internet project called ZeroNet that uses BitTorrent to distribute uh, websites. And they actually leverage uh, Namecoin to provide easy human readable names for the websites in their system. So you can have a decentralized DNS that uh, maps to decentralized websites um, that are distributed through the peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent network. I mean, this is totally cypherpunk, like futuristic stuff, and it's happening now. Very cool. Um, and, and finally, uh, perhaps the most popular and most well-known, uh, widely used application of Namecoin uh, was this web app that was developed by some uh, YC alumni, uh, a company called OneName. Uh, it's basically a registrar. It's, it's a centralized web app, but it, it's an easy way for people to kind of get started in using these systems where you can actually register a name on the Namecoin blockchain and then create a, a profile that is also kind of stored uh, and linked uh, on the blockchain. This was, this was my profile. Uh, the name that I registered is Litecoin, and uh, that's the name that I still have uh, today. Uh, and you can see, you know, I've verified my Twitter profile, and I wrote some, you know, basic biographical information and linked my website. And yeah, it's like a, it's like a, it's like an about.me page that's just stored on the blockchain. Uh, very cool. Now, one name is uh, important because. Um, they, be, being the most popular application ever built on Namecoin, uh, they were actually like pushing the limits of the system in terms of how many registrations it could handle. And they were also, you know, very interested in scaling their application to support, you know, millions or potentially billions of people. And so they were very interested in, in, in finding out, you know, how can we do this with Namecoin? And so um, the company itself was actually founded by uh, like academic PhD distributed systems engineers. And so they did what a lot of engineers did and they like really like dug into the system. Like the, the, the just went deep into the, uh, the underlying system in the network and they were gathering as much data as they could to figure out, you know, you know how is this system working? And, and how can we possibly scale this? And they made some very interesting discoveries uh, that led them to make some very critical decisions about how to scale their app. So one of the discoveries that they made is that over a period of time that they were monitoring of five weeks, they discovered that uh, one mining pool that was securing the network uh, using their computing power uh, had over 60% of the computing power in the network um, for two weeks and over 50% consistently for the next three weeks. If you know anything about how blockchains work and the security model of blockchains, you know that this is not good. 
And this is not good because uh, if, if you control more than 50% of the computing power uh, on a blockchain network that is securing a blockchain network, then you can actually start to rewrite history. You can start to censor transactions on the network. You can steal names that are being registered by other people. And so at the point that you gain control, majority control of the computing power in the network, you basically own this network. And so for these five weeks, this pool, F2 pool, owned Namecoin. Everybody who was using Namecoin was just completely subject to their whim. This is not what you want when you're building a production grade system, a serious, uh, you know, critical system for DNS or any other kind of uh, security sensitive applications or business related applications. And so this, you know, was a concern of the one name developers naturally. Um, another discovery that they made is that the software itself was rather buggy and um, experienced a lot of inconsistent uh, uptime where nodes would crash a lot, often, very often. Um, the, the blue lines here are, sh are sh when they spike up, uh, that the access, axis on the left-hand side there, as you can see, is time, the minutes between blocks. So that highest spike is over 250 minutes between blocks. That means that when you, when you first send a transaction on the network, it could be over 250 minutes before you even know if the transaction was confirmed or not. To put, in, to put it into perspective, the system is designed so that that's only supposed to take 10 minutes. So it was taking 25 times longer than it should have at its worst periods of downtime just simply due to the nodes of the miners crashing these aren't even the nodes of just normal users. These are the nodes of the miners, the people who are putting, putting burning electricity to try to, to try to earn money and make the system work. The people who should have the most uptime in the system are experiencing 250 minute delay. So this was a serious problem for anybody developing applications, but one name in particular, again, because they were the most widely used application. And this was creating problems for them. Their users, you know, filing support tickets, like, hey, why is this taking so long, et cetera. And so they decided to do something about it. They said, you know, we have two options. We can basically just take over Namecoin development and try to improve this situation ourselves. Or we could move to another blockchain that is already more reliable, which leads us into the next uh, blockchain name system, which is called Blockstack. So in September of 2015, uh, OneName announced that they were migrating the name system that they had developed on the Namecoin blockchain over to the Bitcoin blockchain. Basically, they said, you know, on this date, we are taking a snapshot that shows uh, who owns what name in our name system. And then we're just going to basically migrate that entire snapshot over to the Bitcoin blockchain. They spent a few thousand dollars on Bitcoin transaction fees to do this. They were able to do this because Namecoin actually uses the same kind of uh, cryptographic keys to secure their names as Bitcoin does. So they could just basically transfer the names to the same keys over on uh, the same addresses over on Bitcoin and the user's keys were, were still valid for controlling those names. So they said, 
they, they said it was an easy decision to move our blockchain ID registration system from Namecoin to Bitcoin. After experience with running the production network, uh, we strongly believe that decentralized applications and services need to be on the largest, most secure blockchain. This is very important. Currently, there is no other blockchain that even comes close to Bitcoin in terms of these security requirements. And so Blockstack as a system was born. Blockstack is really a suite of different services that developers can use to build decentralized applications, of which naming is but one of those services. But the naming part of the system, perhaps the most important that users are going to be interacting with directly, since they are choosing usernames and interacting with other users of a given application with the usernames, the names are secured directly on the blockchain. And this is, this is what that looks like. So Blockstack is a system, it's layered. At the bottom layer, you have a blockchain that progresses in a chronological order. Users submit transactions to the blockchain that register names and then the user will create a zone file, which is basically a text file that is stored off-chain in a block stack server that the user can run themselves or could be run by a third party. And then that zone file will then point to the resources that the user uh, has created whenever they use a block stack application. So for example, you could have a user that registers a name. I'll use mine as an example, litecoin.id. And their zone file could point to an IP address that will serve their uh, website's homepage. Very simple example. The name itself is registered on the blockchain. The hash of the zone file is uh, appended to that registration, again, directly in the blockchain, so that there is a cryptographic link between the zone file and the name. So it's self-authenticating and self-secure on the blockchain. And then the zone file will then point to the resources that the user has uh, created with Blockstack applications. And those resources can be stored anywhere on the public internet. It could be stored in a, uh, uh, um, a personal server. It could be stored on Dropbox. It could be stored in BitTorrent or IPFS. Blockstack doesn't care. All Blockstack cares about was, is the registration on the blockchain valid, meaning that nobody else has registered the name before and it doesn't contain any invalid characters? And, um, and what does that name, what resources does that name point to? Do you mind holding questions to the end, or is it urgent? OK, cool. Just uh, file that away. We'll get to it. Thank you. And, and if you are interested in learning more about the technical details of how Blockstack works, um, they have some uh, publications on their website. Uh, they've submitted their white papers to uh, technical conferences for peer review, and they publish them on their website for anybody that's interested in reading. Um, the, the, the Blockstack team has released a few different pieces of software. They have a Blockstack core, which is uh, basically the core daemon that interacts directly with the, the, the blockchain to register names. And, um, and verify the validity of those registrations by talking directly to the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, they have an iOS client that you can use to build iOS apps uh, that talk to the Blockstack network. Uh, they have a name explorer on their website that allows you to actually see all of the names that have been registered uh, along with uh, history of those names, uh, who, who has owned those names before, and what metadata is associated with those names. Uh, and they just released uh, the public beta 
of the Blockstack browser, which is an application that you can run on your desktop uh, to, to browse this new decentralized uh, internet that uses um, Blockstack names to resolve to uh, decentralized hosted resources, such as websites and other applications. And these are some examples of apps that people have built for Blockstack. Uh, Casa, which is a decentralized home sharing protocol. You can think of it like a decentralized Airbnb. Uh, Ongako Rioho, which is like a decentralized iTunes. Open Bazaar, which is like a decentralized Amazon. Uh, Afia, which is like a decentralized uh, network for managing and sharing a personal health data. And Guild, which you can think of like a decentralized version of Medium. Uh, these are just some examples. There are more that you can find on the Blockstack website, uh, blockstack.org. And the final uh, name system that uh, I want to uh, share with you guys today is uh, the most recent addition to the blockchain name system universe, uh, which is a system called the Ethereum name system, which is built on, uh, as you can guess, the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, this, this is a uh, much newer system, so it's, it's not as mature yet, but there is a lot of uh, community momentum around this because it solves a lot of problems within the uh, Ethereum ecosystem. And so uh, with, with Blockstack, you actually pay Bitcoin to register names uh, for a fixed period of time. The Bitcoin is burned. Um, but with uh, Ethereum name system, you actually just have to put up a bond. So, uh, or put the, na put the money up as a bond and you get it back at the end of the registration period. So the idea is that the cost is the opportunity cost, not necessarily the monetary cost. Uh, but the Ethereum name system offers uh, features that are very similar to the features of the systems that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can basically uh, use the Ethereum name system to map your Ethereum addresses to these human readable names. So you don't have to copy and paste these long, funny looking addresses, or even worse, like type them out if you can't copy and paste them, or it's not safe to do so for any reason. You just type in the, the person's name, and, uh, and the ENS will automatically uh, resolve the name to the address, and you can uh, send uh, your Ether or tokens to that name. Um, and there are several wallets that have incorporated support for this. Um, uh, and of course, the names are registered directly on the Ethereum blockchain, so as long as you trust the Ethereum blockchain or the copy that you have access to, um, you can trust that the name is resolving properly. And of course, uh, the Ethereum blockchain is decentralized, and so it's not controlled by any uh, central authority. Um, so here are some just quick statistics. Uh, these statistics are like out of date, but they were taken sometime uh, this summer. Uh, basically, uh, uh, over 600,000 auctions were started to register um, uh, ENS names. Uh, with a total of 15,946 bidders, uh, resulting in over 167,000 names being registered on the ENS, uh, and a total of 167,822 Ether being locked up uh, or bonded to secure these names. Uh, quite an astonishing feat for a name system that is so young. It just launched uh, earlier this year. Um, <laughs> some funny stats. Uh, the most expensive name that was registered at the time that uh, that snapshot was taken was dark market dot uh, ETH. You know, wh why, why would somebody pay so much for such an interesting domain? Well, the second most expensive one was called open market. And then exchange and blackjack, tickets, payment, trading, registry. So this just gives you an idea of what the Ethereum community thinks this name system could possibly be used for and what some of the valuable properties uh, in this name system might be. Just you know, interesting statistics. 
Um, but uh, that, that top name, somebody paid or you know, posted a bond of over 20,000 ether to get that name. That's, that's over half a million dollars. That's crazy. Um, so in a recent update, uh, the developers said that you know, client adoption during the soft launch period was good, while MetaMask, Etherscan, and MyEtherWallet were the only services supporting ENS on mainnet on launch day. Uh, those have since been joined by Leth, IM Token, Mist, Bitrix, and Swarm, with status, Kraken, Shapeshift, and District 0x expected to add support soon. So these are all uh, companies or projects within the Ethereum ecosystem, and you can see that you know many uh, many of these uh, many people in the community are excited to see uh, see adoption of this new Ethereum blockchain name system. That's all I've got for today. Uh, if anybody has any questions about uh, anything when we went, we went over here or blockchain name systems in general, uh, I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Thank you. All right. Here we go. We got a question right away already from Steve right Phillips. Here. All right. How's it going? So uh, Vitalik, right, creator of Ethereum, like three weeks ago or so, he was at uh, TechCrunch Disrupt and he was saying that uh, right now Ethereum can do about like five transactions a second. Once it gets to six, it can't go any further. It can't, yeah, so then uh, with Bitcoin, and we're doing like three a second. Once you get to four, that, that can't scale. And it seems to me that people are trying to run all the world's software now, all these apps, and like especially DNS. Like think of all those requests. I mean, that would be like, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of requests a second. So are there good plans in place to handle the blockchain scaling issues? I know there's a few designs. I don't know what a hollow chain is, but it's supposed to scale better. <laughs> uh, are there are there good plans in place, or is it it's still kind of R and D, and it'll be like a few years before things scale well? Yes, scalability is uh, perhaps the number one limiting factor for these blockchain name systems. Um, scalability of the the underlying blockchains and. Developers have a few different ideas for how to solve this problem. Uh, one of the ideas is to take as much data off the main blockchain as possible and basically just settle on the blockchain maybe like once a day or once a week or however often they, they're comfortable with you know settling uh, and while still trying to maintain some security. Um, another uh, another potential, I mean, that's, a, that's basically the main solution and really the only solution because when you actually try to scale blockchains up, um, you, by like increasing the block size limit or in Ethereum, the gas limit, um, you're increasing the, the computational load on all of the nodes that are processing and verifying all of these transactions. And if you do that past a certain point, the system starts to centralize in a kind of irreversible way, inherently, because running a node becomes prohibitively expensive. You know, only the, the richest and most powerful miners and businesses in the network will be able to afford, like, Fifteen, twenty thousand dollar nodes to process these huge blocks. Uh, so, the main solution that developers are dealing with is mostly moving as many of the operations off chain or bundling as many operations as possible uh, before they actually hit the main chain. I see. Uh, yeah. Do you think that sharding? I've heard some people talk about sh trying to shard where you have like different clusters of users, uh, like storing different data, and it's almost like almost like different blockchains and somebody you need to be able to kind of route to the transactions that you're looking for. Do you, th do you think that's feasible? Uh, yeah, I mean, sharding is a proposed solution. Um, I wouldn't call it a silver bullet just quite yet. There's still a lot of unanswered questions and, and unresolved challenges with that, but promising. Okay, cool. And then I just had a quick question because we need to wrap it up. But um, I was wondering the same thing that somebody asked on the internet, and so now I want to ask you. <laughs> mm -hmm. You were talking about the domain names earlier. 
yep. and that they were going for this amazing amount. And I was a little confused by that. Um, uh, who's paying all this money to whom? And who is in control? Who is playing the domain game name as the person on the internet was mm -hmm. wondering? Yeah, so uh, in, in Namecoin, the, the rules uh, for registering names are just set by the protocol and uh, the coins for registering names, I forget whether they're burned or whether they go to miners um, in Namecoin. So I won't speak to that particular system. Um, but it's one or the other, basically. Uh, the, the cost of names is set by the protocol. It's like a flat fee of like 0.01 name coins or something like that. And uh, that fee, that registration fee is either burned or it goes to the miners, uh, one or the other. Uh, in Blockstack, um, anybody can create a new namespace. Once a namespace is, uh, when a namespace is created, uh, the namespace creator basically sets the policies of like how much a name, how much a name costs, uh, how long the registrations are valid for, etc., and um, and then the rules for that namespace are basically set forever unless you choose to do a backwards incompatible hard fork of the system. But anybody can create a new name system and set their own rules, uh, including whether or not the fees to register names go to the namespace creator or whether they're burned, or whether they go to miners, or something like that. Um, for the default namespace in Blockstack, which is the .id namespace, the registration fees are burned. Uh, and this is to uh, prevent miners from basically paying themselves to register all of the good names. Um, and then in, in the ENS, uh, the, the names are released by, uh, I believe it's a Dutch auction, or no, Vickery auction process, and um, the winner of that auction doesn't spend their money, it's on the name. Their money is just basically put into a smart contract escrow, so the money is just sitting on the blockchain, locked up uh, until the name registration expires. And once the name registration expires, if they don't renew the name registration, they get their money back. Uh, and so that, that's how the kind of money is flowing through these systems. Okay, one, one, one really, really last question because he wants to ask. And one I just can't really say last question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So really it's just a follow-up point to Steve's observation, which is I think it's important to make a distinction between read requests and write requests in this instance, right? Because ultimately read requests are super cheap, right? Because everybody has a copy of the, of the registry. So you're really just paying for the processing time to write the mappings, right? So my question originally re revolved around, if, do you know if Blockstack mirrors the design of the original DNS? Is it like hierarchically distributed and does it have like a root authority? Blockstack is a uh, fully decentralized or peer-to-peer -peer system, so anybody can run a block, a full Blockstack node, which has an authoritative copy of not only the blockchain but the entire database of name registrations. And so, uh, as you uh, pointed out, read uh, transactions are you know, happen at line rate as fast as your computer can give them to you virtually for free. Those transactions don't hit the blockchain. You're just reading a database. Um, uh, and then uh, write transactions only happen when somebody needs to register a name, uh, update uh, their registration, or transfer their registration to a, another address. Um, there is no, r like, root. Um, you have to either register a name in the .id namespace or another namespace that somebody has created in the system. So you have to have a fully qualified domain name. You can't just have like John. It has to be John.id or John.bit or whatever other na valid namespace has been created in the system. Does that answer your question? There's no master list. There's no root mapping repository anywhere. 
the blockchain is the master. Like everything that happens on the blockchain that is valid according to Blockstack's rules is the master list. The the database, the name database that your Blockstack server builds based on all of the valid transactions that have occurred on the Bitcoin blockchain is the authoritative list of names that have been registered, which public which key pairs own those names and what uh, zone files those names map to. Is all publicly available in the chain when you're a part of a, the blockchain like it's that? A, is that all, part of the point? It is all public. OK. Yep. Well, that last, explanation, that, that last explanation is why I like John to come up here and explain this stuff every couple of years, because it's the most straightforward explanation of all this stuff that, that I've heard. And there's been so much hype around this stuff lately that um, I think it's uh, important to keep up to keep up on it. Um, cool. Well, thank so you for thank inviting you me back. Thank you very much for coming back, John. Yeah. John Light. Thank, thank you. you.